Douglas, thanks for being here with us tonight. Hoping to hear your thoughts on a lot of things that have been bothering a lot of people for a long time and see if we can tie together things like the Holocaust and things like 9-11 and how it all works together. You've been working on this for so long, you're really a master in the background at this. So give us your ideas about 9-11 and the Holocaust and how it all fits together. Well, I'm certainly no expert on 9-11 per se, and I want to, of course, uh, convey my respect for people who have made a career of pursuing the truth behind that uh, day of atrocity and uh, terrorism. So one of the things that we can do is kind of qualify a kind of parallel uh, between the complexities of 9-11 and the Holocaust. One of the things that immediately comes to mind that I have to contend with is Holocaust denial. And I need to put into perspective the reality of the Holocaust and I need to contextualize it. That is uh, the way that I handle 9-11. And this is not necessarily from the obsession of technical detail. And that's one of the challenges that I run into concerning the 9-11 in, for lack of a better word, I'm going to use the word incident for now. It's an act of terror, it's an act of, of atrocity, but just for the most detached uh, way of addressing it, we're going to use the word incident just for now. When you take a look at that incident, there were multiple factors to it. There was the Twin Towers themselves, Building 7. There was the Pentagon. There was what I believe was Flight 93 that ultimately crashed or was shot down in the middle of the United States. And of course, we have uh, arguments that none of this happened in terms of that being shot down at all, that the people were simply smuggled away, taken someplace. We have that idea going on with the Pentagon as well. But what uh, really stands out is the uh, violence and the fervor uh, with which people are wedded to their thesis. And so of all the multiple theses uh, that are out there by various specialists, what strikes me is the ultimate points of contention tend to be around very technical details. With the Twin Towers, was it nanothermite? Was it a miniature nuclear weapon or more? Was it uh, a scalar weaponry technology? Was it a energy beam? Uh, was it controlled demolitions? It's all of these questions which basically have made the argument unprofitable to even present or discuss because everything begins to bog down where no one could answer all of the questions that are presented concerning these terrible incidents that compound into one massive phenomenon because nobody knows that much uh, with an all-consuming degree of technical knowledge. So what I can address are more of the context in which such events take place. In terms of the technical aspects, I think that that has been part of the intention with the people who were responsible for the atrocity was to make certain that everybody gets bogged down in the technical details, gets married to a particular thesis. Not being an engineer, not being an architect, but uh, someone who is just trying to work with what seems the most logical or consistent or reasonable uh, explanation. I've always been a controlled demolitions man, just to provide my stance on that when it comes to the Twin Towers. That doesn't mean I'm correct, but that's what strikes me as the most logical, and I really haven't heard otherwise to convince me otherwise, despite people going into very obsessive detail about their particular thesis or their stance. I think it's far more important not to get bogged down in the technical details of how the towers collapsed. Obviously, the jet fuel is fairly unbelievable as being the cause for towers collapsing, so the majority of us can agree on that or we wouldn't be pursuing or investigating 9-11. We would be accepting the official story. Those of us, which are many, perhaps even the majority at this point, who do not accept it, are willing to pursue other explanations. But one has to ask, in the end, how much do the technical explanations serve us? That would be the same with the Holocaust. What I notice with Holocaust denial is a fixation on technical detail. And the fixation on technical detail will go into the gas chambers, uh, they'll go into the delousing process, they will go into exactly how many people could potentially die within a fixed space within a given time. All of this is quite morbid, in a very real sense, is not serving any purpose. Just like I can conclude after well over a decade, it's got to be like a decade and a half and beyond, uh, after the 9-11 attacks or incident, since attacks would imply a foreign power or a foreign adversary, there may very well have been foreign involvement. I would tend to look at 9-11 as basically domestic in its uh, sourcing, simply because it took the cooperation of 
elements of the United States government, if not the United States government at the highest levels, to allow the foreign operatives, whatever they may have been, to do what they did. So uh, this was obviously, in the end, the responsibility has to lie on domestic sources. Now, of course, who those domestic sources are, we're taken to, of course, the owner of the Twin Towers himself, the man who had all kinds of money to lose if they were left standing, and all kinds of insurance to gain were they to collapse. Obviously, he's a primary suspect. We take a look at many factors pointing to Saudi involvement, Israeli involvement. All of these are quite compelling arguments. The end result is how would they get anywhere or how far could they have gone without ultimate American involvement at the highest levels? Based on what I've seen, there certainly was. We could go into that. I've gone into it before. But what I concentrate on more is such motivations, politics, the context in which these things take place. So in terms of the Holocaust, one of the things that we confront that I think is of importance would be the term Holocaust. It is a legitimate term. The term Holocaust is Greek, ancient Hellenic roots. It means a mass sacrifice by fire or sacrifice by fire. Uh, Holocaustos. And when we interpret that to what we are told happened during the time of the Second World War to European Jewry, uh, that is a very apropos name for what happened. Uh, also, it was a term that was originally employed by the Jewish peoples themselves, the Semitic peoples, during that period of time that they were obeying their tribal god, Yahweh. They were obeying his genocidal orders to eradicate other cultures. When they were in exile from the land of Egypt, looking for a new home, the choicest piece of real estate on the coast of the Levantine was Canaan, which of course stood where Israel stands today as a state that is an occupation of Palestine. And at that period of time, under the orders of Yahweh, our God, the Jewish people annihilated the Canaanites under orders of this mad, psychotic, genocidal, tribal war god of the desert. They were told to annihilate everyone in the land of Canaan, to annihilate all of their cattle. The land itself basically burned down every blade of grass to the root on which a grasshopper was standing. So when they obeyed these mad orders, uh, this was what was known as a holocaust. They were the first people to generate a holocaust historically. As a culture, when they did so, it was part of that tradition of their psychotic, warlike, tribal God to ask for the sacrifices of firstborn sons, to ask for sacrifices of animals. And often these were burned so that nothing would be left for man and everything went up to God. So this was a sacrificial God, a, a God no different ultimately than Moloch or Baal or any of the Canaanite gods. When the Jews obeyed this mad God and uh, did what they did, they conducted a proper Holocaust in which the scorched earth policy led to everything, homes, people, and uh, we're assuming their cattle burned to be offered up to God uh, leaving nothing left for man other than the land itself, which of course they happily occupied. So uh, that was obviously a religious war in the name of their God, and it was for the Jewish people what crusades could come to mean for Christians or what jihad could come to mean for Muslims. And of course, any uh, Muslim will tell you there are various layers of meaning or nuance to the word jihad. It could, of course, imply a uh, spiritual quest, a uh, inward struggle, uh, as well as an outward struggle. And uh, of course, it could also be abused and uh, turn into a military plunder campaign. Uh, the same with Christians and their crusades. Of course, peaceful crusades can be held in which you have televangelists uh, raising money, uh, potentially, hopefully for a charity, as opposed to building another mega church. And uh, in that case, a crusade is a term that is used uh, for such an aggressive campaign. Uh, and a crusade can also mean a military campaign uh, that uh, could uh, degenerate, as it has historically, oftentimes, into campaigns of plunder and, uh, and rapine and atrocity. Now, uh, the term Holocaust, of course, it's very difficult to think of a positive nuance <laughs> to that term. So when the Jews applied the term Holocaust, the way Christians applied crusade or the way Muslims applied jihad, 
we're obviously talking about something that uh, in, in which we cannot imagine any good coming of it. And uh, the uh, Jewish Holocaust was carried out on a monumental level uh, to the point where uh, Christopher Columbus, who was a Morano, uh, which was a crypto Jew, uh, he was uh, basically someone who was a Jewish person who practiced their faith in secret. Uh, the Spanish uh, used the word uh, Morano, uh, which means uh, basically dirty pig, because the Jews were famous for not eating pork. So uh, a Jewish person who uh, actually indulged in pork in front of uh, people he could considered to be Gentiles or, uh, or, or Goy uh, for the sake of fooling them into thinking that he was practicing their faith and then turned around and practiced his own faith was so hypocritical that uh, the Spaniards referred to them as uh, dirty pigs. And uh, well, that's certainly what Columbus was. And he and the Cor Corlombuanos brothers uh, were basically a Jewish mafia. And when they invaded the North American region, the hemisphere of North and South America, and Mesoamerica, they began a campaign of Holocaust. They began to uh, kill all of the natives, uh, to burn them so that nothing would be left for man, everything would go up to God. And the ultimate intent was to eradicate every living being on the uh, North and South American continent uh, in the American hemisphere so that they could uh, have a Zion, a place for the Jewish people to settle. Uh, away from the persecution in uh, Europe. And uh, his uh, primary sponsors were Jewish. He reported to them prior to, re before he would even report to uh, the king and queen of Spain. So uh, we have here an example of another Holocaust that was so massive that it changed the climate of the world when they annihilated the entire Native American civilization through slaughter and through plague, uh, ultimately uh, these vastly developed civilizations, which were hygienic, which were uh, peaceful, which were uh, overwhelmingly superior to the filthy culture of the Europeans, literally filthy because they never bathed, uh, except by accident when they fell into the sea or into a river. Uh, we had a situation in which uh, these people were also farmers. They were developing the land, they had farmed the land, uh, with their mass genocide, uh, we had reforestation. Uh, the uh, land went to uh, back in uh, to the woods, and of course, this resulted in the Little Ice Age. Uh, this changed the climate of the world. This was the first man-made impact on uh, the planet, and it resulted in further climate change when uh, they began to bring slaves over from Africa to work these lands for the whites who were now occupying the lands, and that, of course, led to less blacks able to farm their land back in Africa, which led to reforestation, which again uh, put a lot of the emissions from the uh, trees into the atmosphere and resulted in that little ice age. So this is a man-made climate change. This is irrefutable, it's inarguable, it's incontrovertible. And all of this based on an insane Jewish desire to kill every living sentient human being uh, within an entire hemisphere so they could repopulate it with Jews. Uh, now, um, there's example after example of this kind of Holocaust taking place on uh, the part of uh, the Jewish culture and its assertion of itself, uh, either in the name of their God or in the name of no God, which happened with Marxism. And you had the advent of Bolshevism, in which you had, of course, the advent of many Jewish commissars and the Jewish intelligentsia who comprised the majority of the Bolshevik movement. And, of course, they instigated a genocide that was uh, just massive, uh, um, next to, of course, the unsurpassable genocide uh, that happened in the Americas and still has ramifications to this day. There are still uh, impacts against the Native Americans in uh, the Amazon rainforest, other areas of South America. Uh, we are still living the nightmare of what Christopher Columbus started as a uh, dirty pig. So when we go over to uh, what happened with the Soviet Union, uh, we see a, another example of genocide through collectivization, through state-sponsored mass murder, uh, and uh, the, the end result is uh, so many lives lost that they equal the population of the North American continent, Canada and the United States combined. When you combine what happened in the Soviet Union, what happened in communist China, what happened in Vietnam, uh, the, this uh, enormous amount of genocide in Cuba and other communist nations, all inspired, of course, uh, by the Jewish individual Karl Marx, 
and uh, his uh, oath of allegiance to uh, the nullity or nihilism, nihilism, the, the lack of any god, uh, then you had a godless kind of uh, Judaic westernization of the world and uh, the result of the loss of millions of lives. So when you take into account the uh, well over 100 million people who died in the Americas, the well over 100 million people who died under communism, uh, when you take into account uh, all of these genocides uh, on the part of Jewish Zionism in one case and uh, Jewish Marxism on the other, you, you result in, the, the result is staggering. Uh, a great example of this would be a uh, true mass murder, a genocide, an ethnic cleansing of Germans uh, in Eastern Europe uh, as uh, World War II uh, began to, uh, uh, shall we say, close in on the Reich, and it began to essentially uh, ultimately uh, uh, wind down or uh, in an apocalyptic fashion, in a Gotter Dammerung, uh, Twilight of the Gods, towards the cessation of proactive prosecution of hostilities on the European continent. While this was going on, of course, the Soviets uh, basically activated uh, many of these death camps and uh, killed Germans in them. There were uh, Jews who boasted of the fact that they killed far more Germans than Jews ever died in uh, German camps. So th these are facts, and this is, of course, a uh, to, to give uh, people an idea of how staggering this death toll was. Uh, prior to the Second World War, uh, as recognized on the continent of Europe, uh, the demographics of Germanic peoples throughout Europe was 180 million German peoples. There were 180 million German peoples. Uh, after uh, the cessation of proactive prosecution of hostilities in Europe in 1945, uh, you had basically 80 million Germans left. That's 100 million Germans disappeared. 100 million Germans were killed. So when you add all this together, the, uh, the, the, um, the people who died in communist China, Vietnam, Cuba, and the Soviet Union all together, you've got something like uh, 300 million peoples. When you have uh, well over 100 million that died in the Americas in terms of the native population, when you add the 100 million Germans that died, we, we're talking about uh, literally uh, half a billion people. These are half a billion people that were directly murdered because of Jewish insanity, Jewish ideology, the imposition of their, of, of, of their will uh, upon uh, Gentiles who were insane or stupid enough to buy into their crap. <laughs> and when you recognize this, then yes, the, this is how we have to contextualize the Holocaust as it took place during the time of the Third Reich. We have to remember that the National Socialistisch, which is the proper name for what Americans uh, deride or denigrate uh, as the Nazis. We have to remember Nazi is an acronym. Uh, the reason it should not be applied historically is because it's a propaganda term. Uh, the term Nazi is uh, like the term Kami or the term Jap or the term chink. It, it's a meaningless term. It's a propaganda term that's used in time of war or in time of conflict as a vernacular. Uh, it's colloquial. So when you read a history book on communism, no serious uh, scholar or academic is going to write about the history of communism and say, and then the commies did this, and then the commies did that. It simply would not be, uh, it, that, that would not be acceptable uh, within an academic work. If they're writing about World War II in the Pacific Theater, no modern academic or scholar is going to say, and then the Japs did this, and then the Japs did that. Uh, and certainly if they're writing about uh, the Korean conflict and the Chinese involvement, they're not going to write if the chinks did this and then the chinks did that. But they use that term with World War II in the European theater. They use the term Nazis. Okay, this is absurd. It's a propaganda term, and yet scholastics are accepting of this, and they are accepting of the uh, derogation of the National Socialistisch when they could just as easily, with just a few more uh, pegs on the entry board, uh, enter the term uh, National Socialist in English if they don't want to write it out in German. 
Now, they don't do this because, of course, we're still very much legally in a state of war with the Third Reich, which I have emphasized before. It's very important to remember that the, uh, I myself, of course, was born in a Axis nation, uh, the Nationalist Republic of China. Uh, the uh, Nationalist Republic of China, of course, is still legally at war with Communist China. Uh, the Nationalist Republic of China was the first allied nation originally to take up arms against the Axis long before the National Socialist East and Soviet invasion of Poland, which uh, the Westerners take as the beginning of World War II in 1939, uh, and quite ignorantly so, because that's not when the Second World War started in Europe. It started in 1933, which, uh, with, of course, the Judean declaration of war against Germany, uh, the Thalreich, in an attempt to destabilize and overthrow the Hitler regime. So uh, when uh, Judea declared war on Germany made the headlines, uh, at that point in time, uh, Adolf Hitler had to declare a state of emergency uh, because he uh, was trying to stabilize a, a government in a deep depression. Uh, we'll go into that in just a moment as to what the factors were behind that and uh, how he tried to uh, cooperate with the Jewish people and tried to resolve the conflict. Uh, but the reality is, of course, when it comes to actual armed conflict, uh, the first people to take up arms against the Axis were the Chinese. And that was in 1931 with the invasion of Manchuria, and of course that was in 1937. Both of these, of course, are uh, prior and uh, right around the time of 1933. Uh, so if uh, you count, of course, the uh, annexation of Manchuria by the uh, Japanese and the establishment of their ally, Emperor Puyi, in power of Manchuria as uh, not necessarily an act of overt conflict, then you could say that the first shot fired in the Second World War was the Jewish declaration of war against the Third Reich in 1933, which meant that the Reich was at war almost from the moment of its inception. Uh, but in terms of actual armed conflict, uh, we have the Chinese uh, fighting the Japanese uh, beginning in uh, what was recognized by the rest of the world, even though uh, armed conflict was going on since 1931, certainly recognized by the rest of the world in terms of their involvement, their supply, uh, their insurgency in the China front with the sinking of the USS Pan A and the HMS Lady Bird, His Majesty's ship, the Lady Bird, a British ship, and uh, uh, the United States ship, the Pan A. Uh, both of these were coincident, and uh, December uh, 12th through the 13th of 1937, my father uh, was in theater at that time on an American gunboat. And uh, at that period of time, of course, uh, America and Britain found themselves uh, in an illegal and undeclared state of war with Japan in the China theater. So at that point in time, uh, the Chinese were being supplied. Uh, most of the supplies were going to the communists. Uh, the Chinese were ultimately forced because of the American and British support for their communist enemies to switch sides to the Axis. Uh, which is why uh, they lost their seat on the United Nations as part of the Security Council, and their seat was ultimately overtaken by the Communist Chinese, who, of course, were allied with the Soviet Union and the United States and uh, Great Britain. Now, of course, with Communist China on uh, its seat, with its seat in the Security Council, uh, such as it is, uh, we have the continued state of war between Communist China and my native nation of the Nationalist Republic of China as reestablished on the island of Taiwan. We have that as a situation in which the United Nations is at war with Taiwan. Taiwan is not recognized by the United Nations, even though it's one of the largest economies in the world and one of the most successful democracies in the world and is indeed very much a model nation state, uh, almost ideal in terms of the quality of life uh, that it delivers. Uh, uh, one of the highest in the world. Uh, despite all of this, of course, it's uh, not recognized and uh, is not on the maps. Uh, so it is a basically uh, considered a rogue and renegade state, as is the Third Reich, which America is uh, still at war with. Now, anyone who questions this, there's several factors that need to be brought to their attention. Uh, the United States, of course, started uh, daylight saving time originally in World War I in their war against the Kaiser. It lasted for uh, literally around uh, a year at the most. And this was under Woodrow Wilson. And when he launched daylight saving, it was, to, it was called wartime. And, of course, it was a massive inconvenience. And they, of course, did away with it by popular demand 
as soon as World War I was brought to a uh, cessation of proactive prosecution of hostilities in 1918. Now, Roosevelt brought it back as soon as he was in power in 1933. Roosevelt, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the Democratic Roosevelt, as opposed to the historic Republican Teddy Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, immediately declared a state of war. He said America was under a state of immediate mobilization. He, of course, had every intention of going to war with someone. Uh, the uh, idea was uh, ultimately, uh, originally, the British Empire. Now, uh, because of this, he set America on wartime. He reinstituted wartime in 1933. Uh, this is all indisputable. This is, this is quite factual and uh, easily vetted. And when he uh, set America back on wartime, the condition was, of course, it was wartime. It would not be, we would be taken off of it whenever the war ended. Well, the war ended for the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union ended. Uh, basically what happened was that uh, in uh, September of uh, 1989, uh, just prior the Soviet Union going bankrupt, uh, in their desperation, uh, because Mikhail Gorbachev had every intent of abandoning his people, his nation, and defecting to the United States, Mikhail Gorbachev, along with the French Republic and uh, the British Empire and the United States, uh, notably accent China, uh, which of course uh, was not in this particular game, because the original ally against the Axis was nationalist China, and that was now an Axis enemy of the United States. Uh, the other four major allied powers, minus communist China, got together and made peace. This is very important. Made peace, signed a declaration of peace with both East and West Germany. Uh, in other words, with the German Democratic Republic, the GDR, and the BRD, the Bundesrepublik Deutschland, or West Germany. Now, they signed a separate peace with both of these nations, and of course, it was so they could expedite German reunification, and the Germans, now at peace with the Soviet Union and the United States and France and America, uh, could use their enormous economic power to float the euro. So this was an absolute necessity to get uh, settled uh, prior to the Soviet Union's collapse. Now, once that was settled, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev defected to the United States and the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, that was a monumental historical uh, maneuver. Uh, that would be similar to Adolf Hitler defecting to the United States in the middle of the Second World War. Uh, so when Mikhail Gorbachev abandoned his empire uh, in order to become a member of a think tank at the Presidio military base, <laughs> where I worked for almost a decade, uh, he set up his offices in the old Coast Guard station. Then at that point in history, Mikhail Gorbachev became the greatest traitor in Russian history. Uh, and uh, the Soviet Union, of course, went into history. Uh, the hammer and sickle was lowered from the uh, Kremlin towers or spires on Christmas Day, December 25th of uh, the 1990 or 91, 91, I believe. And uh, at that period of time, Russia went off daylight savings <laughs> because the war had ended. They had made peace. They lost the war. Uh, the Third Reich had won in the Eastern Front. The Soviet Union was dead, uh, collapsed, uh, and, uh, in, and the war ended for the Russians. So daylight savings was over. You are still on daylight savings if you're uh, an American. You're still on daylight savings if you're in Britain. You're still on daylight savings if you're in France because you're all still legally at war with the Thousand Year Reich in exile, just as Communist China is legally at war with my Axis nation state, my fascist republic of Taiwan, in which I was born. Uh, and, of course, uh, what uh, people are entirely unaware of is, of course, that the nationalist Chinese were fascist. As a matter of fact, in Taiwan, the salute is still the ad locutio. It is the Roman salute. This is the salute in which we swear our uh, officials into office. That's salute for when we take oaths. Uh, and that is, of course, because we're a fascist nation state, which most people are entirely unaware of. Uh, but we are declared the enemy of the United Nations, as is the Thousand Year Reich in Exile. Other Another factor would be uh, a, a detail, and again, people think this is petty and they think this is absurd and they think it is ridiculous, but that's how it, they're advertising their ignorance. During the Second World War, of course, we still had a technology where we had ladies who were literally jacking in phones into a basically a booth system where we had plugs that they could connect, literally connect physically, a call.
And uh, when uh, war was declared, um, they had to discourage people from making unnecessary calls to block these ladies up and confuse them and burden them. So they instituted a telephone tax. This is a federal tax on telephone calls uh, that was a set up during wartime. Now, of course, if you take a look at your cell phone bill, if you take a look at your portable phone bill, any of your phone bills, you will see the federal phone tax is still on your phone bill today because we are still legally in a state of war and that's meant to discourage unnecessary phone calls. Now, everybody just pays that tax without thought because they never look at their bill, they never understand there's a federal phone tax on there. That is a war tax. Now, why is this war tax there? Because you're still legally at war with the Third Reich. Well, how come you can never declare a state of war since World War II? Uh, now, aside from the fact that the Japanese won and demanded that the Americans never declare war again, which is an entirely different subject uh, that I've gone into repeatedly, we don't need to go into that for the purpose of this discussion, the United States cannot declare another state of war because it's still legally in a state of war. It's still legally in a state of war with the Thousand Year Reich in exile. Otherwise, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson could have legally declared a state of war against North Vietnam, mobilized the American people, and won the war. There is no doubt that had he declared a legal state of war against Vietnam and uh, mobilized the population, he would have won the war. Anyone who doesn't agree with this is advertising their ignorance of the Vietnam conflict. To put this into perspective for the American population, during the Second World War, which was supposed to be the good war, the great patriotic war, uh, the overwhelming majority of participants in that conflict were draft days. Two-thirds of the Americans who participated in World War II were draft days, whereas only one-third volunteered. Whereas in the Vietnam conflict, even as an undeclared war, as a police action, two-thirds of its participants were volunteers to fight communism, as opposed to one-third, which were draft days. That's a uh, statistic which all Americans are kept ignorant of. They think everyone who went to Vietnam was drafted. Quite the opposite is true. Americans would far more volunteer to fight communism than they would volunteer to fight the Axis during the Second World War. Whether this is out of fear or ideological alignment is a moot point. Uh, the fact is that the majority of them had to be drafted and forced into service in World War II, whereas in the Vietnam conflict, the overall majority volunteered uh, to serve. So we had, if a legal state of war was declared, there is no doubt that with the mass of the population behind him, Lyndon Baines Johnson could have invaded and destroyed and obliterated North Vietnam and established a democratic Republic of Vietnam united under uh, the gov legitimate government which it had in the South. Uh, now, of course, none of this could be done uh, because they were still legally at war with the Third Reich. Uh, they couldn't declare war in Korea. They couldn't declare war in Vietnam. They couldn't declare war in Iraq. They couldn't declare war in Afghanistan. They've never declared a war in Panama. They never declared a war in Nicaragua. They haven't declared a war in Granada. They never declared a war anywhere. Anywhere have they declared a war. They can't because they're already legally in a state of war. So every other war is simply a conflict that is subsumed within the greater war, which is why, of course, all Americans uh, grow up with the question of, uh, are the Germans the most evil people on earth? Why do I have to kill them? Now, that may sound odd. How could Americans be presented with that question? Well, you're presented with that question from womb to tomb, from sperm to worm, because you grow up playing first-person shooters in which you kill Germans. This is every boy is raised to kill Germans in the United States. In England, you are raised to kill Germans. Every movie you watch is to kill Germans. And uh, uh, all the way up to the pinnacle of inglorious bastards, where, of course, this is looked on as the apex of the human experience, is to kill Germans. And, of course, the entire point is that was obviously a Jewish masturbatory fantasy, inglorious bastards, because it specifically shows Jews who are mobilized to kill Germans, when the reality, of course, was that during the time of the Holocaust, uh, Jewish resistance uh, to the Germans was extraordinarily minuscule, so small as to be insignificant. And what is emphasized, of course, was uh, the Warsaw Ghetto and, of course, the massacre of the Jews who fought back uh, at that period of time and place, which was an exceptional case, exceptional enough, of course, 
where you had a situation where that it went down in history was recorded, of course, as a uh, basically a uh, anomaly uh, for what it was. And the other case was Treblinka, the death camp where, of course, the Jews who had uh, helped other Jews into uh, basically annihilation realized, of course, that they would uh, be the last and that they were in for annihilation themselves and therefore they rebelled uh, in their last gasp. And at Treblinka you had the only uh, revolt within a uh, death camp. So you have these two situations of Jewish resistance. Historically, of course, nothing else occurred uh, at that level. There were, of course, Jewish people who were outside of the Reich or not under its administration or occupation, who did, of course, fight against the Reich in foreign forces, uh, and uh, that, that is a historical reality that's not to be denied. But the idea of inglorious bastards is, of course, a masturbatory fantasy, which is uh, moving that phenomena way ahead in time to a point which is culminating in, of course, the death of the hierarchy of the Third Reich, and all of this is basically a wet dream that all the Americans, of course, cheer for because they're raised to hate these people. Now, all of this, of course, is played over and over again in video games where children grow up to the point where they hate Germans so much that they don't just want to kill them, they want to dig them up and kill them again, which is why they're fighting Nazi zombies. So there's this whole Nazi zombie trip where it's not enough just to kill the German, you want to desecrate their body. Now all of this is of course self-hatred because the overwhelming majority of the American population is German descent. So all of the German descended Americans uh, were so uh, much a majority uh, at the time of the early establishment of the Constitutional Republic that shortly after the establishment of that republic, uh, these Germans who were all considered basically by uh, Benjamin Franklin and the Founding Fathers who were all pinch-faced uh, puritanical uh, New Englanders who were all uh, Anglo-Saxon who despised uh, the Continental Germans. They felt the Continental Germans were just chattel like any other uh, colored slave. Uh, these people of course felt that the greatest danger to America was the influx of German immigrants. The German immigrants, of course, numbered enough where ultimately the vote was made as to what would be the national language in the United States, English or German, and German, uh, Deutschensprache, the German speak, lost uh, by one vote, a single vote. Had the German uh, language won that vote by that single vote, uh, you would have all sided with the Kaiser in World War I as the United States, and uh, there would have been no World War II. There would have been no national socialism. There would have been no uh, national socialism as a global ideology in response to the way World War I ended. So uh, Americans today, of course, are brainwashed, naturally, indoctrinated uh, by what was uh, initially Jewish media to hate themselves, to hate Germans, so uh, they divorce themselves from the German heritage and they hate themselves. They want to kill themselves. They want to annihilate the Germans. So naturally what you have with Holocaust denial is a unnecessary, entirely unnecessary, uh, and in a sense disgraceful uh, overcompensation in the opposite direction where in order to rationalize that the Germans were not the bad guys, the attempt is made to say that a Holocaust did not take place. That's not how the National Socialists, or the National Socialists in the English, uh, saw that at all. Uh, in terms of National Socialism as a global ideology, it's important to remember it's an inclusive ideology. It's inclusive of uh, other races, other cultures, uh, and is not even uh, inherently Judeophobic. Uh, as it's propagandized as. The original, of course, situation for Asia in which this was manifest was the fact that Adolf Hitler had a desire for an alliance, if he could, with both the Japanese and Chinese peoples. So uh, on the day that the uh, Sino-Japanese uh, peace treaty was being negotiated, which was uh, on uh, December 12th of 1937, uh, what had happened was that Adolf Hitler, through his uh, it, foreign dignitaries, his diplomats, had helped the Japanese and the Chinese arrange uh, political discussions in Nanjing, uh, what was then known in the West as Nanking. Uh, at that time, we had a communist Marine Corps general, uh, Evans Fortis Carlson, uh, directly under orders from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 
running loose in China with a full headquarters command in the field. Uh, this isn't a Rambo film or Inglorious Bastards. We're talking about a communist general of the United States Marine Corps who had a headquarters office, had a logistical supply train, had all kinds of clerks with him. He had, uh, of course, officers and men behind him. We're talking thousands of people. And uh, with this full command in the field, Evans Fortis Carlson was so much of a communist uh, that by the time he died uh, several years later or later on in life, uh, it's an indisputable historical fact that he was buried in the United States with Soviet uh, diplomats present to honor him as a hero of the Soviet Union, and he was buried with Soviet medals on his chest. So anyone who denies that Evans Fortis Carlson was a communist is, of course, denying reality itself. Now, as an ideological communist, he was most famous for organizing Carlson's Raiders, which were never reorganized or reestablished after the Second World War because they were a communist organization. And as such, they were useful only during the Second World War, proactive prosecution of hostilities in alliance with the Soviet Union. And as a result, after the Second World War's cessation of proactive prosecution of hostilities, the Raiders were never resurrected as a Marine Corps unit. So that's all these reasons go into showing you how convoluted the situation truly is. And within this convoluted insanity of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, support of communism, Evans Fortis Carlson was working with Mao Zedong of the Chinese communists, and together they launched an attack against the nationalist and Japanese peace treaty negotiations. Now, this was not launched by communist Chinese. It was launched by communist American Marines. Evans Fortis Carlson and his raiders. And they were dressed in ink blackened Chinese coolie uniforms, wearing rice paddy hats. They were the inspiration and model for the Viet Cong uniform. And when they attacked the Japanese and Chinese, the Japanese felt they had been betrayed by the Chinese under uh, oath of honor. They felt the Chinese had no honor. They responded predictably, savagely, and barbarously. This resulted in what became known as the Nanking Massacre, or the Rape of Nanjing. Uh, millions would have died if not for the advent and uh, uh, intervention of Adolf Hitler. Uh, what happened was the uh, German uh, diplomat uh, appealed immediately to Adolf Hitler uh, about what the Japanese were doing in terms of the uh, massacre of Chinese. And Adolf Hitler uh, responded immediately by sending what would seem at first completely ridiculous, a one-ton flag. It was a one-ton swastika flag, uh, what in German, of course, is the Hockenkreuz, the Hooked Cross, uh, a flag that was so enormous, it literally weighed a ton uh, worth of material and canvas. And what the German diplomat did was he unfurled that flag over all of the rooftops of an entire city section of Nanjing. And everyone who found shelter under that Hockenkreuz, that Hooked Cross flag, that swastika, was safe because the Japanese dared not bomb the uh, Hitlerian flag because they wanted the Theodreich as their ally. And so uh, ultimately, uh, Adolf Hitler was responsible for saving 100,000 Chinese in Nanjing and has been hailed as a hero of the Chinese people ever since. This is why, of course, uh, in uh, my Nationalist Republic of China today and throughout Asia, Adolf Hitler is honored as is National Socialism, the idea of National Socialism. And uh, so he is very much a figure of uh, heroic proportions, uh, Idi Amin Dada, the leader of Uganda who actually murdered far less people for being a murderous dictator than any of his successors did, who murdered far more than he, had a statue of Adolf Hitler built in the capital of Uganda, Kinshasa, that has since been torn down due to American intervention in Kinshasa uh, and in Uganda, uh, in which the Americans uh, falsely claimed uh, that Adolf Hitler was gay and started a homophobic genocide in Uganda where they're killing gay people under the influence of American missionaries. All of this was, of course, of an anti-Hitler campaign by the American government because of their still being legally at war with the Theld Reich. But when I was in East Africa, I walked into Kinshasa, the capital of Uganda, and saw the statue of Adolf Hitler that had been erected by Idi Amin Dada, which no longer stands there. And they've destroyed all footage of it and all photographic evidence of it, but the reality was that it was there. I saw it with my own eyes. And of course, what happened was uh, they've had since then uh, people like uh, Scott Lively, 
uh, I believe his name is, who is the author of a completely fallacious book called The Pink Swastika, who claims that Adolf Hitler was, quote unquote, a queer whore who was turning tricks when he was a starving artist and a bohemian in Austria, living in flop houses. Uh, this individual went over to Uganda and convinced the Ugandan government that Adolf Hitler was gay. They spray painted the statue in pink. They tore it down and began killing anybody who was suspected of being gay to the point where this individual, of course, who's an American evangelical uh, puritanical Christian needs to be brought up uh, internationally for crimes against humanity. Uh, we have a situation of genocide that's generated by people who claim they're fighting the genocide of Adolf Hitler, even in memory. This is the insanity of American pathology. This is the insanity of American hatred. Uh, this is part of your ongoing war against the Reich. Uh, so with all of this in mind as your indoctrination of unconditional hatred against yourselves, against the German within you, since the majority of Americans are of German descent if they're Caucasian, then you have, of course, your unconditional hatred. Then those who try to escape from this, they go into a direction in which they say, well, the Holocaust never happened, that this, this, this is unreal, that, that there weren't that many gas chambers, this wasn't physically possible. Of course, one of the first people to uh, engineer this was David Irving, of course. I've deconstructed him in the past and uh, would happily do so again. Uh, this is at the point now where, of course, it's becoming more and more mainstream. And this is the problem with it, is that you don't fight history, you use it. Instead of denying the Holocaust, put it in context and see it for what it was, which was an act of self-defense on the part of the Thaled Reich by their own uh, perception. And in this case, they started off by cooperating, of course, with the Jewish people who were willing to uh, get out of Europe. The biggest problem, of course, uh, that uh, was uh, manifest in terms of the Jewish presence in Europe uh, was the fact that uh, the Jews, first of all, many of them were not ethnically Jewish. You have, of course, the Shafardim and you have the Ashkenazi. Uh, in terms of the Shafardim Jews, you have a uh, Semitic peoples, uh, and it's very important to educate ourselves out of the term anti-Semitic, uh, because Semitic uh, encompasses all Arab peoples as well as all Shafardim Jews. So when you speak of anti-Semitism, Israel is the most anti-Semitic nation on earth because they're the most anti-Arabic nation on earth. America is the most anti-Semitic nation on earth because it's the most anti-Arabic nation on earth. So when you speak of the Arabic peoples, these are Semitic peoples who just happen to be Muslim as opposed to Jewish. So when you use that term anti-Semitism, then what you're talking about is Israeli actions against Palestinians, uh, American actions against Iraqis. These are anti-Semitic campaigns. When you speak of someone who has a pathological fear or phobia or hatred of Jews, the correct term to use would be Judeophobic, Judeophobe, like homophobe, or uh, anti-Judaic would be another term for it. Now, these are correct terms that we need to educate ourselves into to deal with the reality of the ethno-cultural identity of Judaism. And uh, when it comes to someone like uh, David Irving, he is definitively uh, anti-Judaic. He is Judeophobic. Uh, now, uh, all of that, of course, would uh, not really mean anything other than the fact that he's influenced uh, more and more people uh, through what he started uh, into Holocaust denial, which has become kind of a religion, kind of a cult. And what it is, is it's a counter cult. It's a counterculture to Jew worship. Because, of course, Americans don't follow Christ, they worship the Jew. What Americans have grown up believing is that uh, Israel is manifest of revelation. That Israel means that we're in the end time and that if we can bring about the apocalypse, Jesus will come back and uh, rule over us from out of Yerushalayim or Jerusalem and uh, the world will see a millennium of peace. Now it's at the point now where we have people in Texas who are breeding red heifers for the sake 
of uh, the reestablishment of the second temple of Jerusalem so that the temple priests can slaughter these red heifers and, uh, and of course, uh, sacrifice and appease the insane, psychotic, genocidal, Judaic, tribal god, Yahweh. Now, all of this has nothing to do with the Christian God. The Christian God is, of course, manifest in Christ. <laughs> that is the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the analogy that I often use, my late and sainted father being a sailor all of his life, uh, serving 30 years in the Navy through uh, three separate conflicts, uh, one, of them uh, one of them a war, World War II, the other two uh, wars, uh, but technically uh, police actions or peacekeeping keeping actions. He was in the Korean conflict and the Vietnam conflict, as the Americans call it, which correctly historically is the second Indochine conflict or the second Indochina war. But my father was in all three of these conflicts, and it says so on his tombstone, his headstone, which was provided by the Veterans Administration, quite rightly. And, of course, um, he, in all three of those wars, including his gunboat service on the patrols in China prior to the Second World War uh, going into uh, legal mobilization, he was a man who saw it all, and as a sailor from over 30 years of service, he maintained his love of nautical works uh, and therefore uh, presented two books unto myself that he treasured, uh, Moby Dick and uh, The um, Mutiny on the Bounty. And one of the things that I emphasize is that uh, Moby Dick is what's called faction. It's historical uh, fiction based on fact, the fact is that there were sperm whales that destroyed whaling ships, hunted down the sailors on the seas. And inspired by these historical events, Moby Dick was written as a dramatization. Now, uh, The Mutiny on the Bounty was an entirely historical incident. And if you were to weld those two books together as the Old Testament and the New Testament, Volume 1 and Volume 2, and said that everything you read in The Mutiny on the Bounty, which occurred in real history and real time, was to be read only in context of Moby Dick, which was to be taken as the inalterable word of God, you would have a mess on your hands. You would have what in commercial illustration we used to call a camel, which is an ugly thing. And that is exactly what you've got with the Bible. You've got an Old Testament and a New Testament in which you've got all of these conflated myths of Sumeria and Babylon and Canaan and all of these Semitic peoples and all of their old, insane, genocidal desert gods and their actions combined with the covenant of your God in the form of Jesus Christ issuing his covenant with all humanity. And some child reading that book is going to say, wow, God sure got a lot nicer as he got older which is, of course, a preposterous way of looking at a divinity that's outside of time and outside of space. So the end result is that you've got this conflation of the fictional and the factional that needs to be distinguished in your interpretation of history. And if you're a Christian, of course, the most important thing in your life, which Americans profess, is supposed to be Christ. Now, when Christ came into this world, the person who tried to have him slaughtered was a man named King Herodos, known as Herod in the Anglo-bastardization. Herodos um, was ethnically an Edomite. He was a uh, converted uh, Arab, essentially. Uh, and uh, this individual, of course, was under the impression that Christ was of the Davidian line of kings that had legitimate claim to the throne, which he was sitting on, at the behest of the Roman Empire. So when Christ was born and the Magi came out of China, which, of course, I've emphasized before in terms of archaeological evidence at this point as incontrovertible, inarguable, and indisputable. When the sage kings came out of China to worship the Christ that they had been expecting because they had been Christian before the advent of Christ, based on traditions which I've articulated in other discussions, the uh, Magi uh, were, of course, presented with the person of the pretender to the throne, who was uh, in Bethla uh, basically in uh, Jerusalem at that time, and that was King Herod. And when they spoke to King Herod and asked about the presence of the Christ, uh, King Herod said, of course, well, uh, my own sages say that he's in Bethlehem. 
And if you confirm that, I want you to come back to me so I too can go worship him. Of course, this was quite disingenuous. He had every intention of killing him. And when the Magi did not return, he, of course, historically, uh, irrefutably and inarguably became enraged and ordered the death of every male child in Israel, or a Roman-occupied Palestine, under the age of two. Because at that point, by the time the Magi had found the Christ child, he was a year or two old. Uh, it had taken him one or two years to get there from China. And uh, so he knew that it was either an infant or a young boy at the age of two, ordered everyone, uh, firstborn son beneath the age of two, slaughtered, and hundreds of thousands of children were killed. This is the man who made Israel what it is today because King Herod, being a pathological paranoiac, would build fortresses. He built so many fortresses so that where, no matter where he was in Roman-occupied Palestine, he could be within reach of a fortress. Now, all of this massive construction generated an enormous economic boom in Israel at the time. And, of course, uh, Israel was running on the energy of that day, which was prior to the advent of coal, prior to the advent of petroleum. The energy of the day was the ergonomics of slave labor. So, in terms of human muscle power, Israel was a superpower. It became a slave distribution center under King Herod, Erodos Magnus, Erodos the Great, and uh, this individual made it the Dubai of slavery. So, Israel was selling slaves off the auctioning block, uh, churning out this mill of labor for Rome, uh, just like Dubai was churning out oil. And as a result, just like Dubai has skyscrapers reaching towards the heavens, Israel had fortifications reaching upwards that provided the people of Israel today, the uh, Hazar Judaic peoples, the primarily Turkic in ethnicity, as opposed to Shefardim, the majority of them, these people now have something that they can take tourists to. Now, without King Herod, er Basilius Herodos Magnus, or King Herod the Great, there would be no stone artifacts for the Jews to take tourists to. They were always the people of the book, but Erod made them the people of the stone. So they could be like Egypt. So they could be like Japan with its shrines. So they could be like China with its tombs. So they could be like everybody else on earth instead of just a bunch of people wandering the desert for years trying to survive on matzo while waiting to kill everybody else on someone else's land so they could take it and occupy it and make it their own. So King Arad is a superhero in Israel. And they like him so much, they've been toying with the idea of putting his likeness on their coinage, on their numismatics, on their currency. And these are the people who heroically lionize the man who tried to kill your God if you're a Christian. But Americans hate God and they worship the Jew. So they all go to Israel and they all visit Erod's magnificent fortresses and they say, oh, this is our way of supporting Israel because they claim they follow Christ. Of course, Americans are anti-Christ, which is why they support unquestioningly the people who tried to kill their God. That is how insane Americans are. They support and worship the people who try to kill their God. They hate themselves so much they want to kill every German on earth. So contextualize that as part of the struggle that the National Socialists were facing, and then you realize why the National Socialists did what they did. Mm -hmm.